2.3 million people a year don't go home safely at the end of the day uh, when they when they rock on into work. You know, that it's just not something that uh, that sits well with me and the, and the team of say 365 as we've got. So we want to do something about it. Welcome to Tech Talks, the podcast brought to you by Nash Squared and hosted by myself, David Savage, that's been bringing you the latest thinking from technology leaders for over eight years. Right, joining me today is Amber. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Dave. How are you? Yeah, good, good. Have you seen the news that, that um, there is some new legislation coming in from the EU, EU? Google and Facebook are being urged to label AI-generated content, which I think is, is a good thing. Oh, really? No, I hadn't seen that. But yeah, I, I agree. I think that's a pretty good thing. Basically to combat disinformation from Russia so that you know if something is legit or not. I mean, it's the kind of thing that it should have happened years ago. Mm. that stuff should be verified if it's actually, you know, credible or not. Yeah, you, well, you'd think so, wouldn't you? Yeah. But I think it's all the um, all the AI stuff recently is kind of bringing a lot of other things to the surface. Yeah. It's like other stuff that should have happened, like you said, ages ago. It's like, oh, okay, well, We now, should probably act. Yeah, we should probably do this now. Um, seems a good time. So, yeah, no, I mean, it's... Yeah, I hadn't seen that actually. But yeah. it's, I mean, all I see in the news at the moment is around Philip Schofield, so that's kind of yeah. Let's not talk of... about Philip Schofield or, or Holly. Oh yeah, yeah that God. kind of clouds everything else, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, most of our listeners will be like, "What? What are you on about?" <laughs> Never mind, you don't want to know. Uh, but no, this this genuinely has some bite because Elon Musk's company, Twitter, um, the the EU's voluntary code of practice basically it could fine Twitter up to six percent of its revenue or be banned across the EU if it doesn't operate under this new Digital Services Act. Mm, okay. that's, that's quite that's, I was going to say, that's, that's heavy, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but was... then I, I, think, I think you've got to be quite punchy with these types of things, because mm. otherwise if it's a really, you know, people, I don't know, like a, an easy sort of thing, or, you know, there's a small sort of slap on the wrist for it, then people will continue to do it. So sometimes maybe you do have to kind of, yeah, I suppose just go in and, put something sort of pretty strong yeah. down so people actually do comply and go along with it. And lots of people are saying that, that the EU won't hesitate to slap the, the fines down to show that the DSA actually has some teeth and it mm. isn't just hot air. Um, yeah, 44 companies have agreed to, um, which include, by the way, TikTok and YouTube, a um, new code of practice which the EU is, is developing, um, basically separate laws on artificial, artificial intelligence with a code of practice already involved. So it's interesting that it's not just the block coming up with regulation. They're mm. working with big tech to come up with stuff that works, but then, yeah, actually making sure that it's got power to legislate. Mm. No, I think it's good because you think all those companies or some of those companies you just listed, they're all so, so influential. Like how many people, I don't have it, but how many people go on TikTok and then take everything You don't have there? TikTok. I don't have TikTok. Oh. I know. I'm you're, probably, really... you're probably here at least 30% more productive than me. <laughs> I was going to say, super boring, but then also I had it for a small period of time and I literally just did nothing besides watch like a thousand and one TikTok videos a day. So I was like, I need to get rid of this and actually start to do something with <laughs> my life. Um, but you think so many people on there, like young kids have access to it. There's loads of stories in the news where they've like mm. tried to copy pranks and then you know, sadly, things have gone sort of horribly wrong. So I just think you have to be so careful with the content that goes on there. So anything that can restrict that and I suppose police that in a sense, I think it's good. Yeah. I think it's great. I like, thought, thought we'd just kind of raise people's awareness that mm. that, that is there. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's a good thing. Yeah, no, as do I. Uh, you know what else keeps people safe? Say 365. Mm. Look at that. Smooth. Look at that link. Smooth. You're getting better with these transitions, Dave. You, you know, after eight years, you'd hope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> About time. Yeah. Uh, Nathan is, I guess, Nathan Height. He's the co founder and director of, of Safe 365 Workplace Safety. Uh, we'll hand over to the interview. We'll be back um, following this interview. So today I am joined by Nathan Height, the co founder and director of Safe three, uh, 365. How are you today, Nathan? Very good, thank you. It's good to be here. Now, you're in the UK. You are a, a native of New Zealand. You've just mo moved over full-time with the family, but you've been coming over to the UK for a little while now with, with Safe365, right? Yeah, quite right. So making a few adjustments, a uh, little bit less backyard and uh, a lot more public transport, probably the two main <laughs> takeouts so far. Um, look, let's, let's talk about Safe365 and why you've decided to, to put yourself in the UK. Um, who are the company, first of all? 
Yeah, look, C365, um, we started the business back in 2016. Um, we work with uh, many thousand organisations, uh, mainly in New Zealand, Australia, and increasingly in the UK, around really helping them take uh, the complex world of work health and safety uh, and our technology platform simplifies it for them so they can make better decisions and, and create understanding and alignment in the business uh, to, to actually improve outcomes for workers and improve business outcomes. And what's your background, if you don't mind me asking? How, how have you come to this? Yeah, I mean, for me, it started as a 14 or 15-year-old uh, volunteer surf lifesaver uh, on the beaches of, uh, of the east coast of New Zealand. And, um, you know, the long and short of it, I had some pretty traumatic experiences as a 14-year-old and then as a 15-year-old uh, on one level, uh, saving uh, saving someone's life, and on another level, um, you know, having to pull someone out of the surf and resuscitate them for 90 minutes, only to to sort of have to tell their partner that unfortunately their their wife and, and mother of, of a couple of kiddies uh, had, had lost that battle. So um, pretty pretty tough for a young person, but that really lit a fire in me at the time about uh, looking after people, um, and that's really been my 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 career ever since for the last 25 years or so um, and really got to a point around um, some things I'd, I'd done in a number of organizations I worked in that worked pretty effectively to, to elevate safety um, and then Safe 365 was really a, a way of sort of uh, scaling that and democratizing access to, to you know, good approaches to safety that makes it simple and easy, accessible mm. to all businesses. Every business struggles with this area. Um, it's perceived as overly complex, and if we can make it really simple and accessible, then uh, it's, it's a great outcome for workers and also businesses. So, so forgive me, to make sure I've got this right. Your background is very much really the, the kind of the sporting side of it, and surfing in particular um, you know, if you have a quick scan of your of your LinkedIn, kind of surf life saving in Australia, and that's really been a big part of your life. So the the switch to corporate health and safety has come later, but has obviously off, offered the opportunity to really think about this in a practical way that can help organisations. Yeah, hundred percent. I spent most of my, um, you know, started off as a volunteer lifesaver, ended up being the the general manager of Surf Life Saving New Zealand, and then on to Surf Life Saving Australia. So that became a bit of a hybrid into sort of the corporate side of those organizations um you know and you're dealing with um issues like global drowning prevention trying to Mm. trying to reduce the global drowning burden um through those roles so that started to really get me thinking much more globally about you know how how do you make a systemic impact on on what is a massive issue um and then when you take something like drowning and you start to look at work health and safety and you see that you know 2.3 million people a year don't go home safely at the end of the day uh, when they when they rock on into work you know that it's just not something that uh, that sits well with me and the in the team of say three six fivers we've got. So we want to do something about it, um, and that's that's what our platform is really driven around. And look, if you don't mind me asking this, like obviously the background that you come from, the environment, surfing, it's very much part of your your personality and your and your, your culture. Kind of that's a that's a very obvious leap for you to make, I suppose. To me, yeah, I get that health and safety matters in work, but it's kind of one of those things that I kind of just think maybe happens in the background that it should happen so is is there a bit of a an education piece and then that leap in terms of getting people to go oh hang on a minute right yeah this this is this is actually a really pressing issue that maybe i'm not thinking about specifically enough yeah it is it's it's it most people when you talk to managers or or directors or c-suite and you ask them if they care about their people of course they say absolutely they do but that's quite different from having the knowledge and the awareness of how to actually ensure people are safe at work, both physical safety as well as obviously psychological safety as well these days and, and health as well. Um, and it's interesting, a lot of organisations are very compliance driven because their perception of health and safety is meeting a regulatory requirement, which every business is subject to. If you think about surfing and surf life saving, um, there, there, there's no um, health and safety at the beach act um, it's people turn up and, and lifeguards look out for those people and they, are, they, are, they just deploy good risk management, good risk-based decision-making to keep people safe. Mm. Um, so there's no other, it doesn't get clouded because of any sort of compliance. So it's driven around culture and doing things for the right reasons and understanding where the risks are and taking action. And so the, 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 the dichotomy there is that's quite contrasting to how business looks at work health and safety traditionally. But what we've shown is that when you can actually get an organization looking at health and safety for the right reasons in terms of actually what do we need to do to look after our people like morally ethically what can we actually do rather than what do we need to do to meet a compliance requirement and um, then you get some real power starting to get you know, opened up among the team and 
all these secondary benefits start to, to get unlocked as a result in terms of their engagement, their productivity, their, their relationships with other colleagues, um, your relationship as an organisation with your customers, um, the quality of work that your people do, all of these things improve on the back of actually having a, a safer, uh, more well work environment. And you talk there about uh, relationships, you talk about engaging, um, very much that kind of, those pillars of democratising something within an organization and you've got you've got something called your safety index which is using SaaS. how how is how is technology helping you reduce harm and improve business outcomes and and, and people to really take um invested interest in this yeah look it's, it's a great question and at, at its core what, what what our platform does our SaaS platform is it really surfaces kind of complex data points from within an organization and it presents them in a really simple actionable way so that people can one understand it improve their awareness and then take action um you know there's risk management enterprise risk management and, and work health and safety are, are perceived as a, a very complex um technical area of business where a lot of uh people in the business particularly around the board table or in the c-suite don't have that sort of technical knowledge but yet they're accountable for it and so what our platform does is it services that data in terms of practical insights to help those people uh, actually understand and, and actually perform a, a better role as a leader in organisations, set the tone, set the culture, and as a result of that, um, the system provides them with very targeted, actionable things that they can do to, to actually improve the organisation. So it might be so, something as simple as um, through our, our assessment product, um, an organisation realises that they're not actually inducting their board members or their management around managerial aspects of work health and safety or governance aspects of work health and safety, they just assume that it's there. Um, and if you think about, say, middle managers who get promoted up through an organisation, very rarely does anyone stop and talk to them about, hey, you're now managing some people in this organisation. Here's some things you might need to think about in terms of their work health and safety outcomes. Um, and so there's all this assumed knowledge in organisations. And when you sort of shine a light on it, which is what our product does, it becomes very, very clear and very obvious um, where those vulnerabilities are and what you can do about them. And it's actually not as complex as um, perhaps people perceive. Um, and so once you once that sort of light bulb switch sort of gets turned on in our clients, then it's it's kind of like unleashing the power of it. It's pretty cool. Um, and so through that, we generate quite a lot of data um, and we're able to start to benchmark that for our clients as well. So mm. they benefit from almost like a giant club of organizations who participate using our, uh, our product through our online subscriptions. Uh, they measure their own organization, they get their safety index so they can see a numerical number that represents their safety uh, capability and culture. And then they're able to actually see how that stacks up against the marketplace that they're operating in. Um, so they kind of know, are we are we there or thereabouts for our sort of industry or our location? Are we a wee bit behind the eight ball and we need to do some things to, to improve? Um, or validate that actually, hey, we're really, we're really on top of this, we're doing a really great job, we're across things. There's always little continuous improvement things that organisations are uh, could improve to get better, um, but it can be quite a validating experience to recognise a lot of hard work that's already gone into this space. And look, the, the business has been around for six, seven years, right? Correct. Um, you mentioned data and it being that light bulb moment. I suppose its ability now to help you really show organisations about emerging trends, emerging risks is helping to fuel your growth as an organization. But in terms of your insights, what should organizations be thinking about? Or what, what, are, what are the areas that, they're, that maybe they have blind spots on, broadly speaking? Yeah, so from a benchmark perspective, it's fascinating. Um, most organizations focus on what they call the health and safety management system, which is, in other words, the policies and processes and risk registers and, and sort of SOPs for how work gets done, the, the paperwork. Um, but when we look at our data set, the three most vulnerable areas are director knowledge. So actually, do the directors of the business at governance level understand the fundamentals around what good looks like uh, as, in terms of governing health and safety? Mm -hmm. That is extremely poor globally. The second one uh, is a mirror image at senior executive management level, exactly the same issue. And then the third one um, is that organizations might have a great management system in place for work health and safety, but they're not actually undertaking any internal sort of assurance activity to actually verify that what is written down on paper is actually what's happening in practice out there. And so there's a there's a sort of a, a focus on getting sort of systems and processes in place. But if a little bit more focus went on to sort of what we'd call sort of audit or verification activities internally to give you that assurance back up to see that 
the things you intended to do are actually happening, um, that would make a huge difference. And those three areas, uh, director knowledge, management knowledge, and audit and verification are the three biggest vulnerabilities. And they're three things that most organizations can quite quickly do something about. Um, and that makes a big difference to the outcomes for workers. Well, look, the, the obvious growth of the business is testament to the fact that this is something that's you know, fueling thought and, and, and that organisations are paying attention to. If, if, if someone is listening and it's not something they've thought about so far, how might they find out a bit more about Safe365? Yeah, look, uh, two, two ways. One is, um, ha- by all means, have a look on our, our website, www.say365global.com, um, or just reach out to me directly. I'm more than happy to have that conversation, Nathan at say365global.com. Perfect. And look, in the UK, we do have some surfing spots, um, possibly a bit cooler than you're used to, but uh, I hope that you uh, managed to, to find some of them, and thank you for your time today. No, thanks very much. I've spent a bit of time with the RNLI uh, guys back in the day in my, my life-saving <laughs> days. They've, they've shown me a few spots like Perrin Porth and some of the Cornish beaches, so I look forward to checking those out once the weather heats up a touch. Thanks very oh, well, much. Look, I, I'll tell you now, Tymouth, where I'm from, has a leg of the World Surfing Championships, but the sea's not particularly warm. <laughs> Steamer. <laughs> First of all, by the way, I don't know, when he talks about the sea being a steamer, Mm. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I have no idea about surfing terminology. No, neither do I. No? No, You're not not surfed before? No, I've never surfed. You know what? I think it looks really cool. And people who do it, they've got like, you know, the surfy kind of beach locks and they look really cool and graceful doing it. You don't think that's you? No, I know. I would never look like that. Seaweed? Yeah, no chance. So I'm thinking... You know what? I'll happily watch these people do it rather than try to do it for myself. I'm sure it'll be a lot of fun, but I can imagine I'd just be falling all over the place. And as you said, bringing seaweed back in with me and everything. There we go. 2.3 million a year don't go home safely when they go to work. That's quite a large number, really. Mm. And then I suppose when you think about it, yeah, I I do agree. I think it's it's not like I think of kind of white collar offices, which is so horribly privileged and. Mm. Silly to think that everyone works in an environment like we work in, where I suppose mm. the most dangerous thing might be you, you could scald yourself on the coffee machine. Yeah. Um, or get trapped in a lift door or something. I, I don't know. Um, but obviously, people do work in far more, uh, mm. not dangerous, but far more you know, risky environments where there are things that people have to be careful of and different safety rules. Mm. Um, so it does make sense. But at the same time, it's it's a, it's alarming when you hear that number of two point three million. That's mm. that's a lot of people. I, I don't know. There was a lot in here that I thought was really interesting, actually, because I think health and safety, and he kind of said it a few times as well. It's one of those things that it's perceived as so highly complex, mm. um, and I think so many people. I know, obviously, in in its kind of simplest form, like us, obviously, just trying to keep people safe, right? But there's so much that kind of surrounds it, and. I think, in a sense, people sometimes take it to absolute extremes. Then, obviously, on the other end of the spectrum, they don't really do a great deal around it. So it's hard to find like a balance of keeping people safe but not taking it to that extreme where yeah. you know everything is kind of going back to health and safety, and then you're sort of restricted to do anything basically. I don't know whether this is a terrible kind of link to try and make, but the pandemic started in like early 2020, mm. and it's midway through 2023. It's about three years. Mm. Global death toll is about seven million. 2.3 million people a year don't go home safely mm. because of accidents at work. Over three years, that's about 7 million people. Yeah. You're talking about the same amount of people being hurt at work as were killed in the pandemic. Like, it's it's big numbers, yeah, and we no, just no. don't even think about no, it. No, it is, isn't it? I think it's because, again, I know it sounds a really kind of, like, sheltered way of looking at it, but... You see so many people here and around the city and stuff, like go to work, come home again and have no issues. You just don't think you know about it. So you wouldn't think it would be, the number would be that high because well, I guess you just don't, we don't really see it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But obviously it happens. And, and and I think that point around, you know, there's no verification of what's written down. You know, there's process, but it's not picked up upon. It's all assumed knowledge, which means there's vulnerabilities. Like you say, we do just take it for, not, for, for granted that everything's mm. going to be fine. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of it's like it's like you said, it's a lot around like the education piece um, and just obviously getting people up to speed with a lot of the processes and stuff. But I think a lot of it is just, um, 
I don't know, it seems like people, like myself included, I would almost just think like, oh, that's fine. And you just kind of accept things sometimes, where I suppose there should be an element of if you're not happy or you see something that's wrong, you should pick up on it or challenge things a little bit more, perhaps. Um, and I guess that's how things that are not great in the workplace will obviously get sort of sorted out, Yeah. really. So it's like taking that accountability um, and sort of speaking up if obviously you're not best pleased about things. And look, this is a perfect example of someone who, uh, you talked about the fact that, you know, lifeguard duties when he was 14 and 15 lit a fire in him about looking after people which mm. is it's great that he's made this his, his career yeah no like say the, where the app has actually stemmed from i think it's great because yeah. he's um like say, the platform yeah yeah the platform like it's kind of um i suppose he's sort of seen an issue and wants to do things better basically just so there's not um yeah i guess just, just sort of like filling that gap a little bit isn't it really it's yeah. like well this was my upbringing and how I sort of got into it and actually it's a much wider issue like you said those numbers kind of speak for themselves don't they yeah mm. now um I think that'll do for today's show very quickly whilst we're talking um we've started an internal world games we have. with Gojo who've been on this podcast on a couple of occasions um Amber you get you get a point per kilometer over the next is it three weeks I think it's over the next three weeks I think so, I hope so. Okay. We'll check back in okay. at the end of the three weeks. How, how many points are you going to get? Oh, see, this is right. This is confusing <laughs> for me. Okay, I can't give you a simple answer. Because I don't do things in K, I do it in miles. Fortunately, the, so, the competition is in kilometres. I know, I know, but I'm going to have to kind of, you're going to have to give me a second to think okay, about okay, that. Okay, okay. Which country's going to win? I'd love to say us, but I think probably the Netherlands. <laughs> or was the USA last year? Was it? Oh, okay. Well, um... Not us, basically. Not us. Anyway, over the, over the course of the next three weeks, we're doing lots of running, walking, cycling. I think cricket is even an, uh, a category on there now. Oh, okay. Then I think yeah, we yeah. might win. All sorts. Yeah. All sorts. Well, India are also involved, so ah, maybe okay. they'll win. Um, <laughs> but to anyone who's taking part in the Nash Squared World Games, have fun. Uh, be safe. <laughs> mm-hmm. Why not? We'll mention that. And uh, to Gojo, who've been on this podcast. Hello. But we'll be back on Thursday.